אוקיי. טוב, סמואל לא כאן, אז אנחנו נדבר דברים אדמיניסטרטיביים נגיד בעברית. מי ש... טוב, כאן האמת כולם נראה לי נרשמו או דיברו איתי לגבי הרשמה להצגה של מאמר, אז סבבה. מה עוד יש לי? משימות. משימה, כן, אז קודם כל, עניין הפרויקט בקורס. קודם כל, יש לנו את התאריך האחרון שצריך להגיש ציונים, זה מתישהו באוגוסט, אז זה לי פחות זמן ממה שקיוויתי. אז מה שאני אנסה לעשות, אני אנסה שבוע הבא להציג לכם כבר את הפרויקטים. ובעצם עד לקראת סוף הסמסטר, או שבוע לפני סוף הסמסטר, אנחנו צריכים לחשוב על, על משימה. בעצם מה, מה תהיה המשימה המחקרית שלכם לפרויקט, לעבור דרך ישעיה ודרכי. ואז לקראת אוגוסט נעשה איזה אולי אירוע באוניברסיטה כזה, שנציג אחד לשני את התוצרים של הפרויקטים, תגישו את הדוח ו, ונסכם, את ה, ונסכם את הקורס. אולי מפגש אחד פנים מול פנים יהיה נכון. טוב, חוץ מזה, שאלות? דברים שאתם רוצים להעלות? אוקיי, אז אוקיי, so we start, and today we have six student lectures, it's going to take most of the time, with some... some kit uh, kishur by me and, uh, and at the end I hope to continue the uh, phenotyping uh, lesson, the high throughput phenotyping ideas. Um, next week uh, we're going to have one student lecture and then the rest of the time I'm going to finish the phenotyping and I'm going to show also one example from my own research that is related to a screen, so it's, it's related to the high throughput phenotyping. And, uh, and then we're going to move to, uh, to a topic of, uh, of big available data sets. So what data sets is the, the last few years have, have a, a big change that have uh, emerged is the, the ability of uh, some big, uh, basically philanthropy efforts to, to make huge data sets. And I think this is now the, the future. So this is going to be the next topic and we're going to have a few guest lectures until then the semester. And we're going to talk about time information and this is basically the and and and, and genotype phenotype so linking uh, what we see in images to what we can measure from from uh, like more omics based uh, studies and this will be uh, the content of uh, our course okay so we'll start with uh, Dima and Ori yeah take it away yeah. shall we start okay can we start go ahead Okay. So, uh, uh, okay, stop. Okay, one second, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dmitri, and with me is Ori Perry, and we want to talk with you about an uh, article called Classification of Protein Localization Patterns Obtained via Fluorescent Light Microscopy. Now, this Article was written in 1997, 24 years ago, by Michael Vibont, and it was a first paper to try to classify protein patterns. As you can see, it, was, it needed to classify five uh, proteins, as you can see in this image. Uh, now, the motivation uh, was first to somehow define numerical description of the image. Given an image, we want to define a vector somehow, uh, which will represent us this image. And after we define the vector, we want to classify uh, based on this vector to one of the proteins, the lamp two or making protein. Uh, to do the numerical description, uh, they decided to use the linking moment. Uh, the key moments are uh, mathemat mathematical polynomials which allow us to represent uh, the image uh, via these polynomials. For example, uh, you can see this round uh, uh, representation and we can use this three, uh, we can represent this round uh, 
image we have three polynomials called by the weight. And they did the same thing to the images uh, which they collected to, uh, which they collected. They extracted them and showed. And uh, the main thing about this Zerinke moment is that they, you can reconstruct the images back, of course with lower, uh, the, with lower dimensions, uh, with uh, uh, not as precise as the uh, original images, but you have some way of to represent the image. After this, we use the uh, Harlex texture, uh, texture features. Uh, these Harlex features uh, show you uh, the contrast between the pixels, how much, uh, pixel, how much uh, uh, there's black or white around the pixels compared to the pixel itself. And after you compu compute it, uh, you can calculate a different uh, 13, another 13 features. Now, why this is the, this Zerinke moment and how the feature textures good is uh, one of the first ways or mathematical ways to embed, to do embedding uh, of an image. Think about it. It's 1997. Uh, you don't have a convolutional neural network. You don't have a... <laughs> Nothing for that sort of embedding and uh, enconic is not, not very common, and it's one of the first ways to do such embedding or encoding of the image. Uh, later on, classification, I think Ori continue from here. Great, just ask for control. Great, so yeah, you can. Keep sharing Dimitri, yeah, great. So uh, in order to test uh, what Dimitri just said, in order to test their method actually, so they use two kind of uh, classifiers. The first one is a decision tree, classification and negation tree named CART. And the second one is a regular artificial neural network. Um, uh, the data they had, they separated into both train and test set actually, and they used the train set in order to train for both the models. Uh, they did some little bit more sophisticated training for the back propagation neural network, and they just continued training as long as the loss uh, decreased, and then they stopped. Regarding the evaluation, so they evaluated both models on top of the test set. Uh, we can see a snippet of the confusion matrix of both the models in here. So as you can see, uh, there is a pretty big difference between the artificial neural network and the classification tree. Um, the rows in the confusion matrix are the white true, while the columns are the predictions of the model. So in four out of five classes, um, we have an advantage for the neural network, while for only for the last one, uh, there is some uh, better performance for the classification tree. Um, the overall accuracy the classification tree got was 69 and the overall accuracy the neural network got was uh, 84. Uh, regarding even the neural network, I think it was mentioned that it was, as Dimitri said, 1997, and it was a pretty shallow neural network, okay? The first, uh, the first layer was just 49 input layers as the number of the Zrenic moments they had, and one hidden layer with 20 neurons, and one output layer with five neurons, according to the number of five classes they had in their test set. So even the fact that they used artificial neural network is, was still a simple net, uh, as was common in this series. Uh, some uh, advantages in general uh, in this paper, so the fact that they are using uh, Zernik moments. So first of all, yeah, according to the fact that it was in 1997, so it was really early to use a kind of embedding, okay? It was probably the first paper to use this kind of embedding, and it is also similar to what we saw in classes uh, in the few weeks ago, let's say, for example, what uh, Asaf showed, the care. So even then, uh, they did some kind of restoration to the image, but the fact that they did it in 1997, uh, the result that we showed, even if they can be better in these days, so it's probably pretty uh, impressing. And one uh, one more advantage they mentioned is uh, also similar to what Asaf just showed last week in his paper, is the fact that they can 
uh, classify individual cells and then use this classification in the majority voting role to classify the entire population. Uh, some minor that uh, disadvantage we can uh, identify is first of all the fact that they have to identify the individual cells manually and of course that we can have better automation for that in these days and they uh, although it was in 1997, they didn't actually compare to other uh, feature sets or to other uh, data sets in general. Um, there are a lot of improvements, okay. Uh, I just mentioned the really basic one. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of uh, new things in the computer vision world in the past years. Uh, I think the most basic one is just using some uh, CNN, uh, as it was showed. CNN are the, probably the best classifier for every data set that contains from images and also can be used in some unsupervised learning and then we can skip the part of manually identifying the, manually identifying, uh, classifying the images. Um, one more thing, uh, probably interesting, is the fact that although it was in 1997, the mission of classifying um, single cells is still interesting until these days. Uh, actually, there are a lot of competitions in Kaggle. Uh, this one is, we show, we saw today and it's actually it's still open. And most of them are part of the human protein atlas. And uh, the fact that it is still a, an open mission, let's say, or an open uh, competition. And there are a lot of people trying to get better and better results in this world of uh, single cell classification. Uh, to summarize, so it was the first paper to classify proteins. Uh, it was also the first paper to use kind of embeddings to the image. Okay, it wasn't so common back then to use some kind of encoding and then decoding the image and retrieve it back again. Um, although these two are facts, actually, uh, we expected to have some more citation for the paper. I mean, the, it was back then in 1997 and it was the first one to use it. So. Uh, we expected to see more than a uh, dozen, that is the actual number of citations this paper have. We expected, uh, we expected to see a little bit more, uh, but uh, we surprised that uh, this is not the case. And as uh, I mentioned, there are a lot of improvements in the computer vision area that can be applied to the uh, technique and to the data set they used and to the model they used. Um, that's it, we'll be happy to hear any questions. Okay, so so I think I mean the the only reason I, I what the only reasons that I listed this paper and, and and a few others I mean picking picking a paper from Bob Murphy Lab uh, from Carnegie Mellon uh, he's is uh, one of the you know the old the, the, the first uh, people who came and, and established this field. Uh, now the problems of, of uh, taking a patterns of uh, proteins and, and, and characterizing them, it's one of the biggest uh, open questions in cell biology. It was already there. He was the first one who had this idea of, uh, of modeling the organization of a cell and the localization of proteins by this type of regenerative model before the neural network came. So I, I thought it could be, picking one of these papers could be, there are, there are papers that are more cited and maybe, I don't know, maybe the idea that, I mean, in general, there is a, you can take a broader context of what the, what was his vision and, and, and look at the, the other papers and stuff. Uh, you can see in his website, uh, you can see all kinds of uh, talks and stuff that you can, uh, uh, that you can uh, appreciate. I thought that, he should be mentioned in this course. He's one of the fathers of this uh, of this field, I think. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So our uh, second speaker would be Samuel. Samuel. Ah, yeah, you are here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I need to share screen. Go ahead. One second.
Right. Um, this paper talks about bringing uh, cross modality through the use of deep learning into microscopy. So, what does this paper aim to solve? Uh, not everybody can buy an expensive microscope, such as TED and SEM. Not every lab can buy it. So you take uh, so you get images from a budget microscope, and they made a generative adversarial network where if you input images from a confocal microscope. You get output images which match those that you get from a ten times better microscope. So you don't have to buy an expensive setup. You can use the deep learning method, which they showed over here, and you can get better images. Uh, so let's get a background about microscopy. So confocal microscopy is a very old technique where they use point source of light without the whole exciting the whole sample. So that you have very little dye and you don't disturb the sample much. But as you all can see, the image is not very good. Stead microscopy is something which is new and which is growing. It is ten times better than confocal microscopy, but it is expensive. Uh, and then you have to disturb the whole sample with uh, with blasting radiation. If you look at turf microscopy for very thin samples uh, with where you don't have much depth. You use turf, uh, but then it is very very expensive because it uh, collects data from out of observable region as well. So what did they do? They made a GAN network which can take uh, inputs from a 10x microscope or a confocal microscope and give an output of image which matches those of a 10 times better or 20 times better microscope. So that was the whole point of the paper. And this was the only point of the paper, actually. So, uh, how did they do it? Uh, they had a generator uh, which was generating the training data. Uh, whatever was generated by the generator was given to the discriminator, which was then used to discriminate it against the ground truth. And they did around fifty thousand iterations, and where sometimes they had uh, to modify the learning rate. And this is how the model basically learned the whole thing. So. Uh, by learning, uh, by training the model, they found out that whatever output was given matched the ground truth of a different microscope, and this brought in something known as cross modality into into this field. So they tried not to be like all the rest of the papers, uh, and and they wanted to show something novel, and this was the novelty of the paper. So uh, how was the model trained? They gave it uh, pairs of high resolution, low resolution images. And they did a long steps for alignment of images and registration, which we'll talk about in the end. So uh, once they figured out that the model was giving a uh, cross modality, they wanted to understand what this network learned, and uh, they took time to uh, to debug the black box, and they found out that the the thing which this GAN network learned was something known as point spread function, which we learned about it in the class. Point spread function is nothing but how a sample image will react will react to a point source of light. So the GAN network over here learned the point spread function. By learning the point spread function, it could generate images uh, which were equal to ten times or twenty times better than what it was given. So you're saving a lot of money. You don't need to buy a very large setups, and and you're saving a lot of time as well. Uh, they also uh, wanted to show that the GAN network, which they made in this paper, was robust. So they gave it a completely different data set, uh, which is under transfer learning, and they found out that on very little data, the GAN network could do wonders. So uh, they brought novelty, they brought cross modality, and they introduced uh, transfer learning, if I can say so. And then this is how the Network learned. This was the training process. As you can see, it learned nothing but the point source function, how uh, the images react under light. So, uh, what are the negatives? It's a relatively short paper, but uh, it has a lot of negatives as well. The network still does hallucinate, as we learned in class. Uh, we cannot reproduce this technique with ease. The pre-processing step for this paper. Is very complicated. You had to remove the background noise yourself. You had to linearly inter interpolate using MATLAB. You had to stitch images, uh, low resolution and high resolution, and then again you had to process it in Fiji. 
So this whole batch of steps, if you make one mistake, you mess up your whole training process. And uh, for how many images are you going to do this step? They did it for 2000 images, but then if you had a data set of 10,000 images, can you use the same technique as well? So this was, uh, this is all about this paper in summary. Uh, it's, it's a great paper which tried to be novel by bringing cross modality to this field. And uh, that's about it. Any questions? Actually, I have a question about the cross modality. Okay. I'll say, yeah, I have a question about the cross modality. Uh, the way they entered the cost modality is by uh, in the discriminator, they took the generated uh, image and give the discriminator this image and uh, not uh, the exact uh, ground truth image, but another image from the same uh, type. Exactly. Yes, they gave it a, they, they compared it with stead image. They gave, so the discriminator got a confocal, they compared it with stead. Ah, thank you. What? Can you repeat that? I I couldn't follow someone. They compared the ground truth with with uh, with a different modality. Yeah, but the question was about the discrimination, about what the, the adversarial component did in this network. Oh, right? uh, Leon, am I right? Yes, in the oh, discriminator. Yes. Oh, in the discriminator, no. In the discriminator they used the same type. Okay, so. Uh, the confocal image of the oh, cell one and the ground truth of cell one. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions? How is it different than uh, the idea behind care or, or, or deep storm? I mean, it sounds, what, what do you think about that? It is similar as you already know, sir. But uh, what I like is the with, with the cross modality which they brought in. I mean, when, when you're like, you don't have to buy twenty five hundred thousand microscope. You can get get it through confocal images. That's the one thing which I like. Yeah, but this is what also deep, basically this is what Deep Storm say, then what the uh, Care say, then what the uh, right. I mean, it's the, the same statement than the Anna Palm says that they can take wide field and generate uh, um, uh, super resolution images. So what, what, what is, how does this paper comes in context of what we've shown in class? They, they didn't explicitly focus the entire paper on that. This entire paper focuses on cross modality. I think that's the only difference. Okay. If there so is any. I mean, so my, 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 my thoughts here are that uh, they come in the same, they, they, all of these papers came about the same time. Publishing a paper takes years, right? I mean, it takes more than a year since you submit it until it gets through the pipeline easily. So, so I mean, basically, I think there is uh, it's the same idea again. But they all probably came out came out around the same time. So if it comes a few months ahead or 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 later, it's not really you know it's not a big deal. Uh, the only thing that is uh, I think that is uh, uh, I can add a statement without making it an argument. Uh, the Anapal paper and the Care paper uh, they, they didn't focus on showing the results for cross modality. They had good results, but they didn't explicitly focus on comparing it with the same ground root of a different microscope. They had, this paper you have, had- you have, of, a, you have wide field images in Anapalm. And first, I mean, we like to go to argue, right? I mean, it's a, it's fun to argue. You don't need to avoid that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going, uh, I, I'm waiting for you guys to tell me when I'm wrong, right? I'm happy for that. And I'm probably doing a lot of mistakes. You should catch me and, and, and correct me. Uh, but the Anna Palm, for example, they do, they do that exactly. They take a wide field image, which is a very simple microscope, and they show that uh, that they can, from that, they can reconstruct a super resolution image, which is a completely different microscope. And I agree that this paper shows that on three different settings, right, of pairs of microscopes. So this is like more systematic in terms of uh, cross, cross, showing that it works generally for cross modality. And that it, as they did limit themselves, and this is what I was uh, hoping to hear from you, Samuel, 
they, they, they didn't limit themselves to a specific structure, I think, like, like the other papers, they had only the, these filaments and they had to, so they, the other papers limited the, themselves to very specific uh, uh, types of, uh, of uh, organelles. And then, uh, and then they could, you know, and then, and then they showed they could do it. And also what they also uh, did, most of them, they used simulated data. So they did simulated data because they knew already what they are going to look for. And then they showed this work, which is cool because you don't need a lot of training. Here, you, they actually needed to do the dual images, which is just hard technically, as you mentioned, the alignment of that is not. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, if you have a big data set, what will you do? You can't sit for every single image. Even if you make a pipeline for it, it's not going to be practically possible. What? Uh, like the image alignment for 50,000 images or a million images, if you make a mistake somewhere in the pipeline, it goes all over. I am not going to do a mistake because it's not, you know, I'm going to work <laughs> on that, but it's, uh, but it's not, you know, I mean, it's I have a really, it's a proof of principle. It's not practical to take pairs of images uh, system, unless it's a really a large project. I mean, you're not going to, and, and then you can, well, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions? Okay, so our third speaker would be Igor and Gil. Hello, okay, one second I will share. Hello. Please tell me when you're able to see the screen. We are able. You able, yeah? yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Gil Shamai, and I will present with Igor Medvedsky, Noise to Void. We are going to talk about two articles, Noise to Void, also known as N2V, and Probabilistic Noise to Void, which is PN2V. Both were written by the, by the same author, uh, author and authors, uh, Alexander Kuhl and uh, his colleagues in 2018 and 2020. The problem both articles are handling is something that we're all familiar with, image denoising. When we speak about noisy image, there are two values that we must, that, that we handle with. First of all, the S, the signal. This is the clear image, the ground truth. Then we have the N. This is the S. Then we have the N. N is the noise. It can be generated from various sources, the microscope light, mi microscope light or the lens or anything else. Then the noisy image is the X, which is S plus N. Image noising is a well-known problem. Uh, there are already some algorithms that handling it. The traditional alg algorithm usually takes as an input, uh, uh, takes for the input uh, pairs of images, the ground truth in image and the noisy one. The noise in the ground truth, they, they, they build a model uh, that, and this model know how to predict uh, later input uh, noisy images. Uh, we can see an example of it over here. Uh, this is very similar approach to what we saw also in care for image restoration uh, a few lectures ago. There are additional methods that takes, in, that takes it even one step further. In, uh, in, it requires pair, pairs of noisy images. They take two images of the same scene with, with different noises, obviously, and uh, they build a model that gets a, a noisy image and, uh, be able, and is able to predict a, a, a clean image. But both need no pairs. But what if we don't have pairs of images to learn from? If we have a database of only single images uh, available, like happens a lot of time with different domains, especially in our field in biomedical uh, images. Uh, this is where noise to void come in. This is an algorithm that can learn how to denoise using only using a group of only single images. The database contains only single images. It doesn't need to be a better with better for performance or com be compared to the traditional to the, to the traditional algorithms. In case where you have uh, in case that other algorithms can work, just use them. It, it, this algorithm need to be able to work under this condition that other algorithm algorithms just can't. Noise to Void has two basic, uh, sorry, Igor, yes, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Gil. I will continue from here. So Noise to Void has uh, two basic assumptions that are very important. Uh, the first assumption is that voice has, uh, the, voice, the noise pixels are stochastic and don't have any patterns. <clears throat> uh, the signal pixels, however, are dependent on each other. 
and noisy pixel can be predicted when looking at pixel around it. Um, <clears throat> Another term that you have to know before we go to algorithm is a, <clears throat> is a receptive field. The set of pixels around a given pixel are called a pixel's receptive field. Uh, we will use uh, this receptive field, as I told before, for predictions. You can see it in the image on, on the right. Okay, thanks, Bill. Next slide. So uh, for noise to avoid training, we will use a receptive field with blind spot on the pixel that we want to predict. It's very important. It is the main idea of the algorithm to blind the pixels that they want to predict. Okay, so you can, as you can see it on the image, on the right image. So we ignore the value of the pixels that we want to predict uh, to prevent learning uh, identity. Uh, this, te this technique can prevent uh, pixel-wise independent noise when a CNN uses the same noisy image as input as target. Uh, on the left uh, uh, image, you can see <clears throat> an example of uh, masking, as we call it, bl blind blinding. Uh, one of pictures pixel and try to predict it from receptive field. You can see it with a, a blue uh, line. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so to optimize the, the running uh, time of solution, we will use a blind spot technique with some improvements. First of all, we will pick randomly patches of size 64 by 64 pixels in, it, in each page. Uh, we'll pick randomly n pixels for restoration. As I explained before, we will blind all of those n chosen pixels and try to predict their values from related receptive field. And next one, please. Okay, here we can see an uh, uh, output of experiments. So on the first line, you can see results of applying noise to void on image with simulated noise. Here we can see measure, measurable uh, results. Uh, you can see it with the PNSNR uh, noise to uh, signal to noise ratio. So uh, noise to void slightly worse than traditional methods because it has less data to train on, as Gil explained earlier. On the other hand, the less free lines <coughs> are captured from different types of micro. Here, noise to void has a huge advantage because there is no clean or noisy references, only captured image itself. And you can see, especially on the second line, good, uh, Gil, you can, uh, yeah. Uh, on the second line, good improvement in picture quality. Noise is removed. You can see on the left and on the right. Here, we don't have uh, measured numbers, only visual comparison because uh, we don't have reference. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> according to authors, uh, noise to wood uh, also has uh, three main limitations. The first one is pixel that is very different from its surrounding. Because we use the receptive field to calculate blinded pixel value, it makes sense. Yeah, uh, You can see it on the left side upper image. Yeah, thanks. Second limitation is high error rate. Again, because we use neighbor pixels to predict value, uh, 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 if they also have errors, the results gonna be blur blurry. Uh, it's uh, called D. It's uh, yes. What, yes, thanks, Gil. And the last limitation is uh, related to one of our assumptions: if noise is not random uh, but has some pattern, we can we can uh, do good predictions on it. You can see it on the right image. Yes, thanks. Okay, so now Gil. Okay, now we will speak. We've spoken until now until uh, about noise to void. Now we'll speak about the second uh, algorithm. It's a probal, probal, probabilistic noise to void, PN2, P, PN2V. This algorithm is very similar to N2V. The main differences between those algorithms are with the assumption uh, and some part of the implementation. In the assumption, uh, we assume that we have information about the noise. We assume we know the distribution of the noise. It's known by building a model using a set of calibration images, which you can see here on the right, uh, which are a set of images usually, usually only taken only from the light of the Microsoft without anything that are taken in advance. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then we build a special model, a special model, we called it a, a noisy model. And of course, because of that, the, the model that we build is per hardware. Every microscope is going to have its own uh, model, its own noisy model. In PN2V, we have the same pixel, we use the same pixel masking idea like Igor explained before. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> sorry. 
we do it again to to uh, to avoid learning the identical image. The prediction, however, uh, part is different here. It, it does not predict the, only the value of the pixel; it predicts the probability to get the uh, to get this value. Uh, then, in order to make the denoise, multiple predictions are done per pixel. In the paper experiments, they did 800 predictions per, per pixel per image, and then they calculated the weighted average to, uh, for, it, for each for each pixel. The weight of the the weight of the uh, the weight of each uh, of each uh, value is actually the the probability for to getting this uh, value. And then uh, they call it uh, the minimum. Uh, then they do a, uh, they call it a minimum mean square error. This appears uh, appears along the along the article. This. Okay, here we can uh, see the probability distribution of a given pixel. We have this pixel number two mark over here and over here. Uh, we can see the input noise image. This is the input noise image. We can see the ground truth, and we can see the MMSC prediction. Over here, we can see the distributions. In green, we see the distribution of the noisy model and the input uh, the, and the input pixel. And in, in orange, we can see the, the distribution of, the, of, the, of our model and its prediction. And in, in black, we see the ground truth, which we see it's very close. See, those are very close to each other. Okay, so let's have a short discussion about uh, those two articles. First of all, they're pro. They can be used when other, other algorithms just can't because they use only single images. They both contain very creative idea of masking the pixels and then predicting by, uh, and, uh, by, and by this avoiding the actual noise. Uh, for, for both algorithms, the code is available and I must say it's pretty readable also. The problems we found in the article are basically in the in the, in the first article, uh, N2V is compared it com it has compared evaluation values of PSNR only when uses simulated data and simulated noise. It, it does not contain uh, uh, any any evaluation data for uh, uh, for image for real images with noise, and. Um, PSNR, PN2V, it's, it's something in the paper, they have limitation that they work currently only on a single channel and they require the calibration data. We are, we are not fully aware of how this data is uh, available with data sets. We asked, it, uh, we asked the author about that. We, when we'll get an answer, we'll update. That's it, any questions? Questions, thoughts? Okay, so, so can you explain again the, the noise model? How do they calculate the noise model? Uh, we, well, well they, they, they take those, uh, those calibration images of, uh, we don't know exactly how it's taken. It's probably only the light of the Microsoft and get, take a lot of images uh, of that and feed a different model. It's a different model in the code. Uh, how they both merged eventually, I'm not, I, I, I have to dig into the code and see exactly because it's not very well described in the, in the article, but they have a different model only for the noise. So Separate. If, I, if I try to imagine what they did here, they took a calibration image. So calibration is what you do before, right? The, you need to calibrate your system. So you take images before you try to use your system. Uh, so the image, this type of image is multiple times, and then for each pixel, they build the distribution of the noise because you know what the only thing that they have here is noise. They have yes, that, right? And then yes, yes, right. Okay, so basically this is the main. I mean the the big the big change here from uh, noise to void is that they need to actually do a lot of preparations per machine before they use this technique. Uh, Exactly. exactly. And other than that, it's the same thing. Yes. Yeah. No, no, noise to void, actually, uh, the main assumption here is there is no any pattern uh, on, the, on the noise, and yeah. uh, you don't have any assumptions on, on the noise. Right. Uh, here, you do have yeah. assumptions, and you don't know what is the distribution of, of the noise. Right. So noise to void, you don't have any assumptions, because you always want to predict some pixel. You don't have any information about its location. And you want to predict yeah. it from from the, the environment. Okay. Uh, okay. Interesting. Uh, I would say also that the 
I mean, I, I'm not sure that it's covered. I mean, it, it's, these are two computational papers in principle. So it's very different from what, you would, uh, what we are used to see in, in this course, which is heavy with the tons of figures and tons of, you know, trying from here and from there. So it's a very uh, concise uh, papers, which are focused on the technical idea. And I think the idea is, uh, is uh, creative and, and it's pretty cool. And, uh, and, uh, and that's it. And then this is the paper. Okay, I want to, sorry. What, one question, uh, Kyle, maybe I missed it. Uh, what is the difference in, in the results, in the accuracy between uh, PS, P, P, N to V and N to V? How much is uh, the, the effort of... Uh, they are not comparing the them. The, it's not comparable. It's the, two, I mean, the, I didn't see any comparison between them. The first one, you know, you, you, the first algorithm, N to V, you, you just take any data set uh, that you have uh, single images, uh, single noise images and learn on it. And then you are able to predict. This one, the PN to V is, is like a subset specific to a microscope. I mean, you have a microscope, you do it settings, you take the pictures, and then you are able to denoise your pictures of this same microscope. It's not the same, it's not the same game, I think. It's the same idea of masking and everything, but it's, I, I don't think it's the same, um, it's the same usage. The, the PN2V is much more specific. Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, interesting to see if all that hard work that done is PN2V is actually worth it, uh, or you can take just N2V and get good results. Well, I'm sure that because you have the distribution of the noise, you must, you must get better. But again, I, didn't ha I don't have any comparison. Maybe it's worth looking for, but... A yeah, good idea to ask yeah. another thing to ask. Yeah, yeah I, I would imagine, you know, based on that, based on the two papers, that the, and also uh, noise to void came before uh, probabilistic noise to void. I, 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 I just want to add something. Uh, can you hear okay. me? Maybe, maybe there is comparison that I missed. Uh, I, can, I can check. No, no, there this. is. There is. <laughs> ah, there is. Okay, can you hear good. Me? Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I just a few minutes tried to say something, but you probably didn't hear me. So, okay, okay. I, I want to add something. Uh, as I uh, showed here in uh, one of our slides, uh, uh, measurements in, in the first article are, yeah, here. Measurements in the first article are only visual. Last three lines, as you can see, that, cap that are all captured for microscopes, uh, you, can, you can compare only visually. There is no any measurements because there is, there, they don't have any reference. You understand, Lior? It's an answer for your question. You can see the, uh, all, all the images that, that Microsoft is captured, uh, they're all uh, blurry or with some uh, noise, and you don't have any clear reference. So yeah, but, uh, you can compare only visually. Yeah, but they could take a data set that has uh, the ground truth also. I mean, there are ex existing data. They just didn't, I mean, they didn't present it. They could take uh, and learn, although it's not the same usage, they could do it and, and do this learning, but they didn't. So uh, it, it, I didn't see, I'm um, worth checking if what you, what you ask about numerical uh, cooperation between those two, but I didn't, I didn't bump into, but okay. In principle, they could have done simulations to compare that probably. I assume that what, what happened here, I mean, if, if you try to think what happened behind the scenes, they, they had this uh, noise to void. They, uh, it didn't work very well on the real world data uh, because the assumption doesn't hold of the independence of the noise. Yeah. So they used simulated data or maybe they started simulated and then they got stuck, I don't know. I mean, you know, just knowing how these things that work behind the, the scenes. And, and then they published this paper, which is, you know, it's a cool idea and it's, it's fine. And then, you know, and then they had their, uh, then they did another one on the, on, on the yeah with, with modeling the noise so this is just my maybe my imagination but but yeah okay so i wanted um, to say sorry can i ask something okay so if i understood correctly as you said there isn't a really a systematic way to evaluate the noise to void it's just visually Yes, noise to void, we can compare, uh, they compare it only visually because they no, don't have a ground truth uh, image to, to compare, to, to, do it, to do some measurements like uh, 
like PSNR, like signal to noise ratio. So this is a huge disadvantage of this. Sure. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right. We, we said actually also we mentioned it in disadvantages. In principle, you could think of ways to evaluate that. You could yeah. say, you, took, you could, okay, how? Yeah. You have data sets. You have data sets like, I mean, you have data sets that must have noise images and ground truth. Or like you said, you so can simulate you get, the noise. How, how you, do you get the ground truth? What is the ground truth? You take an ah, image. If, if there, is, there are no data sets with the, with the pairs of ground truth and, and, and dirty image, they're not, I mean, how, you know. How would you take the ground? What, what is the ground? Ah. <laughs> you take an image, it's noisy, right? I mean, yes. how would you get the ground? So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's right. So it's only taking an image maybe and, 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 and make it dirty and we create a simulated noise. Yeah, so that's one way. Take an image and add extra noise to it and then see. And then you can you can see how it improves by going to from the noisy image to the, the inner image. Probably that's what they, you have here in the first line. Did, huh? That is what you have here in the first line. Yeah. The first line exactly. BSD 68, it is a, a, it's a, a real image with, with a synthetic noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the and second experimental, experimental solution that we could have tried is uh, take multiple images, the same thing, and then just average them together. And then in principle, and then in principle, they could get a cleaner image. Actually, they could also can get the distribution of the noise uh, from that. And I think they did something similar in CARE. So yeah, anyway, that's, that's another possibility. One project in, uh, in, in the lab, uh, where we have a <coughs> undergraduate student who, is, who are trying to do something, uh, a cool idea, basically stealing an, an idea from the lab of uh, Michal Irani from the Weizmann Institute. Uh, that what she showed, she showed, so she takes an image and then she reduced the resolution of the image, right? And then she learns mapping from the low resolution to the high resolution image, okay? And then she uses the same, they use the same transformation and try to use the high resolution image to improve even further. So there is an assumption here, right? That the same transformation going from low resolution to high resolution would also work from high resolution to further high resolution. In um, actual, I think this assumption is, 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 is uh, it makes a lot of sense because uh, you have in the same image, you have different, you have things that are closer and things that are different uh, and more distant. In my course copy, it's not clear. And uh, there is a group of uh, undergraduates in, in the lab who are, who are trying to play with that. So actually, 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 in my course copy, there is a chance that it will work better than on real images, on natural images uh, from the world, which is not microscopy because, the, the shapes are pretty simple. Let's call it like that. The shapes and the and the structures are pretty much simple. This this is a chance. This this can make a chance that it may work for microscopy. Well, but well, we'll see. Maybe. I mean, there are. Uh, I mean, the, the, we have uh, groups working on that. Currently, they didn't get uh, far enough that I, I I'm convinced that if it works or not. But yeah. So uh, Asaf, so basically. If you take uh, the original image and you make uh, the same ones, the same one with a better uh, microscope, so you can detect the distribution of noise or how to improve it, and basically, basically you can compare between the distribution of noise to make it even a better uh, image versus uh, the what Michal does, right? That she takes an image and makes it uh, uh, so, in a so lower there, there is a problem. I mean, first, uh, like Samuel uh, discussed, when you go to another microscope, you need to do the alignment, which is not trivial at all. So it's hard work first doing that, OK? Second, what is changing between the microscope is not only the noise. There are other things that are changing, right? That are, that totally are different image. For example, point fringe function, right? I mean, for example, you know, every microscope, you have different, different Things that, that also change. So I, I wouldn't, I don't think that this is the way to go. Okay, so uh, I want to show you one thing before we go to Osaka. Uh, so basically, I'll share my screen. So this is, let's see, this is page eight. This is a manuscript that came out. 
uh, when uh, toward the end of uh, 2020. And what they do here is label to label. And I think it's very similar to noise to noise. I think uh, Gil uh, uh, mentioned noise to noise. I want to repeat that again and then show how, what they do here in principle. So noise to noise, before Gil showed noise to void, he, he mentioned noise to noise. Noise to noise means that you take two noisy images, you learn the mapping from one to another, and because the network can only learn structures that exist in the images, it, it must ignore the noise, right? And then in principle, you're going to get the mapping to a, to, a, to a cleaner image in terms of noise. Is it clear? The idea? It's a simple idea, but it's, it's pretty cool, I think, also. It's all, it's, it's all the same idea of mapping between one and another. But uh, given that uh, uh, there is no way that the network will learn the patterns of the noise, uh, when you do it, you're going to take, so you take two noisy images and, and then you use the transformation to improve that. So here it's, it's a very similar, I mean, in terms of the techniques, it's exactly the same thing, but the biology here is a little bit, uh, uh, the biological idea is actually makes sense. So they say, okay, you have different staining from different uh, organelles or molecules, right? For, for different proteins, you can use different staining, different uh, salmonin fluorescentin, so fluorescent uh, markers. And uh, each marker is better at one thing and worse at other things. So, so every time that you do that, you, you mark yourself with the fluorescent uh, markers, you want them to be as specific as possible to what you want to image, right? But, but still, it's not perfect, the specificity. You also get some other fluorescent that is not specific to the objects that you want to image. Uh, and so what they say here, we're going to take two fluorescent channels of different, so we're going to, to label ourselves with two different uh, uh, antibodies, let's say, of, uh, of fluorescent. Each of them have their own noisy patterns that are not specific, but they have the specific patterns in both of them. And now if we learn the transformation from one to the next, we're going basically to focus on what is real, what is common to these two images, and then we're going to ignore all the, it's not noise here, it's non-specific uh, fluorescence, right? Which for us is, is noise in terms of the biology. So it's the same idea computationally, but you can bring it to the world here of, uh, of actually making some, some better uh, biological trick, right? So, so getting better labeling from it. But I thought it's a nice, uh, could be a nice uh, wrapping up to, to this bunch of papers that talk about this mapping. Okay. And uh, let's say, uh, unless there are other questions, let's go to 10 minutes break. So we get back at the uh, uh, 14 past three, and we're going to talk about segmentation. So actually, I want to ask you about the last uh, thing you showed. Yeah. So uh, th there are uh, two, uh, two uh, there, there, it is the same image of, um, it's the same issue, but in two different um, um, layers. Yeah, these are, so you take your image. In, the, in this case, you fix your images. You, the, the cells are already dead, right? I mean, you, you fix them and you stain them with a fluorescent marker. So you, right. do two, you do two of them. You take one fluorescent marker and then another fluorescent marker. That they, they could be in different colors, right? You could take green and uh, red or green, right? Or something. But then you see colors, other, other but, particles but, of them. But, they go to the same uh, protein, right? So you take here some filamentous structures, here it's uh, actin, I think, a uh, structure okay. called actin, and yeah. you image it one time with the uh, phallodin, and at the same time with the uh, AC15 uh, antibody, AB is antibody, and then you take, yeah, you take images, basically there are two channels. Two channels, but uh, as you, you can see uh, in two channels, the same uh, part of the, of the cell, yeah. But it's you not like in my article that I work. OK, so I'll talk to you about uh, this uh, later. Basically, you image, you, you image, yeah, you image the same plane. Yeah. But each time, OK, each time you, 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 you emit in different, so you, you use different uh, uh, spectra, right? So yeah, you, so you see different uh, parts. Especially, you're, you're, especially you, you image the same plane, yeah. but you look at, the, at different, different spectra with different lasers. And this yes. is how you get one time uh, this uh, antibody and this time the other fluorescent uh, marker. Okay? okay. So you don't look at different okay. locations or anything. It's the same location. It's the, should be should be ideally the exact same image. Okay. But here you have beside noise, you also have the 
the non-specificity of the of the marker. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, see you later. Loan. Okay. So, before we move to the segmentation papers, uh, we finished last time exactly at the right spot, I think. So segmentation is a is a is a big deal, and uh, I mean, you know, when I presented to you the cell profiling, one of the first steps was almost always. Now with deep learning, it's not exact, not necessarily, but 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 definitely before that, and also in not only in, in screening but in many other applications, the first step is the segmentation, nucleus segmentation or cell segmentation, and. Um, and this was, you know, it's, it's a big, it was, it, it is a big problem. Everybody wants to solve it. And one of the big advantage, advantages that were made is this competition in 2018. And that really brought uh, thousands of teams, like 3,000 of teams, I think, applied and uh, competed on this uh, in nuclear segmentation challenge. And they had a very diverse uh, data set, and we're going to hear about, about it. Uh, in the next three talks, uh, which I think was really driven forward uh, the field in terms of uh, thinking what are the computational, uh, the right computational aspect that can be used to tackle that. So, uh, yeah, so to the universal nucleus, find, uh, nucleus finder, uh, the public data set you see here, 37,000 annotated the uh, nuclei, many, many teams, even much more submissions and, uh, and yeah, and more. And, and, and I think that the, the, the idea would be to make it something uh, general, that you wouldn't need to optimize your segmentation manually for each uh, data set that you apply, but the segmentation will basically be an almost a solved problem in bioimage, uh, in bioimaging, in bioimage analysis. So I think the three papers that we are going to hear about now, all of them are offspring, or maybe at least two of the three are offspring of this uh, competition. So I think they came with ideas, uh, with the uh, new ideas, and then they pushed it and, and came with three big segmentation papers that came around the same time, or yeah. So our first speaker now is going to be uh, Alina. Hi. Wait, I need to present it. Okay, can you see my screen? Wait, I can't see you. Okay. We can see it. Okay, great. So I'm going to present uh, the Nucle AI there, which is a parameter-free deep learning framework for nucleus segmentation using image style transfer. Okay, so this is uh, an overview of the approach, but basically they are using two uh, main neural network softwares. And uh, one of them is the uh, mask RCNN, which basically separates the different objects uh, an image or video. And as you can see here in the example, uh, using a convolutional uh, model, it uh, creates masks. Uh, as you can see, the contour of the different uh, objects uh, of the image here in different uh, colors. And the second uh, software they're using is UNET, which is, I think, will be presented next. And actually, they are using it, as you can see here, only for refinement and correction of the nucleus. But the big novelty here in the paper is the data augmentation uh, using synthetic images 
uh, when they use the style transfer uh, to do that. Okay, so before uh, getting into style transfer, let's see what is really done in this uh, process. Uh, they take first all the images and they cluster them by uh, their style. Uh, for each uh, cluster, uh, a style transfer network is trained to generate synthetic images. But how, how it is done? They are taking the original images style, as you can see here, the example of the green one. And then in the press segmentation, they measure the size and shape of the nuclei from this uh, specific image. And then they find from a database of 100,000 nuclei that were already labeled, uh, images that resemble Fildi's distribution of the shape and size. And they produce a synthetic image that we know already the annotation and the nuclei uh, position. Sorry, <laughs> one second. Okay, so this way we're generating a lot of pictures that are fake pictures, right? They're not real, but uh, they added that way for each cluster. Uh, from their data, they generated 134 uh, clusters. So they augmented about 3000 images uh, to their training data. And this way, they were able to uh, overcome the main issue of uh, all the neural, neural network uh, limitation processes of the, um, the training data. So just to get an intuition of how the style transfer works. So the idea is that you have a picture of the content let's say P here, the Mona Lisa. And on the other hand, you have the style. Let's say the Van Gogh Impressionist style. And you want to create a picture of the content, the Mona Lisa, in that style. Sorry. So you need to convert uh, the content and the style to a black and white image where the white are the activation here of the content and here of the style. And then you combine these two in this formula when you can uh, set weight for how much content or how much style do you want in the uh, end picture. So style transfer basically enables uh, robust detection uh, since uh, in our example of uh, nuclei wall, uh, you add a variety of cell type, staining methods and uh, image modalities. A very cool uh, things that thing they did here in the paper is they asked whether the synthetic pictures can be distinguished uh, from the real ones. For this, they took several fake and real images and gave it uh, to experts in their institute. And they asked them, do you, th do you think uh, each picture here in the panel, there are several fake ones and several Real ones. Do you think it's a, a real or a fake? And very interestingly, it couldn't be disting distinguished because for the fake ones, uh, only half, about 59%, were uh, predicted as fake. And for the real ones, about half, 56%, were predicted as real. Here we can see the results of uh, their method. So here they took four different data sets to test their uh, model. And basically they took a side from each uh, data set from the training uh, for the testing. And DSB stage two wasn't at all in the training. So as you can see in the results, uh, their proposed model in pink doesn't have a huge advantage over the best uh, competitors 
in the ball, just as, as I've mentioned uh, before, in 2018, only slightly better. Now, because they claim the code wasn't available, they, they didn't compare them uh, in the rest of the data set. But as you can see, it makes it, it is much better for DSP1 and for flu and for his uh, data set. Okay, so summary. So in summary, as I said, uh, the novelty here is uh, the augmentation of the training data using synthetic images, using uh, style transfer. And that way they uh, extend the variety of images uh, and made a better model. Uh, and uh, it outperformed all the deep learning and classical methods they compared to. And uh, we can think that this model can be besides the nucleus detection. And as I said, uh, it didn't do much better for here, for, for DSB2. Um, and because the code was missing, it wasn't compared to them in the other uh, the data set. That's it. Question. Question, thoughts? Uh, yeah. How styles are relevant to biomedical uh, images? How what? Uh, styles, you can change style of, of the styles. image. How, how it's relevant to, to our course. Okay, to, so uh, uh, not sense. just the course, to, in general, to, to medical in, uh, or biological uh, images. In particular, in biology. Yeah. So here, as you can see here, you have different cell types. You have uh, different tissues, different markers, different fluorescence. And uh, you can see the same picture uh, with different styles in biology, as you can, as I showed in the Mosin Lisa example. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, um, does it answer your question? So so it's it helps to 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 define cells or or it to... helps to to segment the nuclei from its surrounding. This is the task to segment the nucleus, right? Yeah. And you need to to refine the model to detect what is the nucleus. Okay. And to detect it, you need to separate it from its surrounding. So its surrounding is the style. Okay, thanks. Other questions? So, so I think the field is going, and we are going to see that also in the other uh, papers, going into generalizing, right? Using as much data, as, as much diversity in data as possible. So in this case, the idea is nucleus uh, detection, nucleus segmentation which is a common task, but then you have all these different uh, imaging techniques and, 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 and labels, et cetera, which show completely different images, but still eventually the, the task is the same task. So, and, 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 and the network apparently is becoming uh, better when you feed it with diverse data. It learns to actually generalize the task of finding the object uh, rather than, uh, which is, you know, it's a, uh, it is intuitive, but it's also counterintuitive. So that you don't need to be to feed it with your specific data set. Sometimes actually being general is what's going to help you improve improve your uh, performance. Okay, so we are moving on to cell poles. Uh, Alon and Leon. Okay, so hello, hi everybody. My name is Alon. Uh, me and Leon are going to choose uh, cell poles, which is a generalist algorithm for cellular segmentation. Uh, this article is uh, very recent, it's from 2020. Um, so the key feature of this article, so uh, we're talking on this, on segmentation, uh, this is the whole context. 
Uh, so this is a deep learning based segmentation method. Uh, it can generalize well for all the sorts of different uh, cell. Uh, the innovation in this article is that there are, um, there are several, and Leon will talk about it, but they are representing cell as a topological height map. Uh, it does not require any model with training or parameter adjustment, which is nice. And there is a support community contribution on the training data. So I will talk about this briefly because we saw it. So the typical uh, image processing pipeline is, uh, is microscopy. We're getting the image, uh, doing some sort of augmentation and uh, segmentation and data analysis. And uh, we, we want to understand the last part is the, is the most interesting. We want to understand some sort of new uh, ideas about what's happening to the cell. But before that, we need to do segmentation. So uh, segmentation is not an easy process. Uh, we, we, of course, don't want to do this manually. Uh, so we want to do this uh, automatic without any uh, configuration or parameters. And also, it's not that easy because uh, it can, for example, on the left, you can do this. You can think it's one cell or three cells. So it's not an easy task. Uh, so previous work samples, uh, compared against mass RCNN, which Alina talked about. So I will not go, uh, will not talk about it again. Uh, and Stardis, which is another method, uh, they're doing some sort of uh, feature extraction, calculating the object uh, probability and uh, radial distance, and then doing the convolution network to get the mass. So this out this so cell post uh, compared against uh, these two methods. Uh, so what data set they used? Uh, they used two kinds of data set. Uh, they, they, they wanted to show first that it's working on, uh, on specialized data, which is uh, 100 fluorescent images. And they used also uh, generalized data, which contains uh, different types of uh, image cells for all kinds of, uh, of uh, rocks, fruits. Hi. Okay, so uh, in order to understand the algorithm, uh, we first need to understand how they did the, the training, how they labeled the, their data for the training process. Uh, the first The first uh, stage on the training, on the labeling of the training data is to ask from a human user to manually annotate the outline uh, of the cell in the center of the cell. This stage is the only part of the, of the process that's done by a human. Once they had the, the center of the cell and the outline of the cell, they calculated the heights map like uh, Alon talked about in the key features. Uh, Doing so, they uh, treated the center of the cell as the highest part of the cell and the outline uh, as the lowest part of the cell. Uh, if we compare it to Stardist, where they extracted the probabilities uh, of the whether a pixel is uh, uh, with the, inside the cell or not, here they calculated and uh, produced these probabilities. From the heights map, they calculated the two gradient maps, the uh, vertical and horizontal, and then they uh, meshed them together. Uh, here on the right, you can see the, the meshing of the gradients, and uh, you can see that uh, it's treated like a heights map with different directions. Using this data, uh, they trained the, a unit, and uh, in the unit, they also passed the style. Uh, here you can see it, like uh, they did in the article that Alina talked about in uh, Nucle AI Zero. Uh, so uh, when coming to segment uh, an image, they take the, you take the input image, you pass it through the unit, uh, which predicts the vertical and horizontal uh, gradients. You mesh it together and uh, from that uh, map of uh, gradients, 
you want to extract the outline uh, of the cell in order to do the segmentation. Uh, they process, they uh, develop the process they call the follow the flows. Uh, you can think about it like uh, standing on the center of the cell, which is the highest point, and uh, you start uh, walking in uh, some direction till you reach the bottom. You walk with the gradients till you reach the bottom. This point of the bottom is the outline of the cell. If you do it several times and in different directions, you get several points on the outline of the cell and you could connect them and get the, the entire outline. Once you have the outline, you could do the masking or the segmentation uh, very easily. Uh, so uh, once we understand how they did the segmentation, now let's talk about uh, how they measured whether it was successful or not. Uh, for the single cells, they used the IOU, the intersection over union. Uh, the intersection part is the parts of the ground truth and the prediction which overlaps. And the union is the summation of the two areas of the ground truth and the prediction. Uh, for the entire image, uh, before that, for the cell, once you have the score of the IOU, uh, you choose a threshold and above this threshold, usually they choose uh, 0 0.5 and uh, above this threshold, you consider a cell to be a true positive. Uh, for example, 0 0.5 of IOU is approximately 70% of the uh, areas that overlaps between the prediction and the ground truth. So for the entire image, uh, uh, they use the average precision where you can see here on the right. Uh, Alon will continue. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so about the result, uh, they trained two types of model. One is called specialized model, which is on the, the specialized data set, which was 100 uh, images. And the other is generalized uh, model, which is a model trained on the all, uh, types, all sorts of types of cell. So we can see that the cell pose is uh, for the specialized model, it's slightly better than the other result. But in the generalized model, the cell pose has a much higher accuracy rate than star disk and uh, mask RCNN. Uh, we can see also two things from the, the result. One is that the specialized model does not work well on generalized data. So this meaning that uh, the model really needs to see a lot of cell types in order to, uh, to work well, to, otherwise it's not, it's not that good. Uh, the second graph uh, from the right, it shows that for each uh, IOU threshold, the cell pose is, is working better uh, for, from uh, Stardust, Stardust and uh, Moscow CNN. Another thing they showed in the article is the generalization of the 2D model to a 3D. Uh, what they talked about is that you actually need uh, no further retraining on a 3D uh, samples, you can take the model that you trained on the 2D samples and predict with it uh, 3D uh, images. Uh, the way they did it is by uh, predicting uh, slices by different axes, uh, for example, by the Z axis or the X axis or the Y axis, uh, predicting the gradients or the, the, the meshed images and averaging the, the gradients uh, by the axis. So for example, if you have the X and Y and X and Z, you take the X of both of them and average them together. Uh, and using that, they could predict and uh, segment 3D images with no further uh, retraining. Uh, okay, so uh, to conclude, Cell pose is actually a very good uh, segmentation uh, algorithm and you can use it off the shelf. You don't need any retraining. They have mm -hmm. a, a free and easy to use uh, model that uh, is online on the website. You can just upload your pictures or images and uh, it will segment it. Uh, it's constantly updating and training uh, from uh, contributions made by other users. Uh, they have a special GUI that you can uh, label your own data if you want to, if the results are not good enough, and then you can uh, upload these images and, uh, and uh, contribute to the entire uh, cell pose model. Uh, and uh, that's it. I, I used it a little bit. It has uh, good results off the shelf. Questions, guys? 
Well, I'm a bit surprised of the amount of images. Only 100 images? It's from that they managed to build a model? That's... Uh... Yeah, uh, if you think about it, uh, it's not that uh, different uh, from the nuclearizer, uh, from 100 uh, images and uh, ex extended the uh, 516 images of different uh, cells and types they extracted 70,000 uh, nuclei. Uh, in nucleizer, we saw 100,000 nuclei. And, and I, I understand, I, I understand. They, they, they cut it, okay. It's... From 100 images, it, it was a specialized model. It didn't work that good. It only worked on, on this type of data. So it wasn't, uh, so it's not enough. Okay. Okay, thank you. No question? So, uh, so what, what, what uh, Leon, just I'm asking from uh, curiosity, what, what did you try it on? Just, just, for, just for fun or is it for something specific? Uh, I just uh, tried it for fun to see if uh, we can use it later on uh, to see how good uh, the results are in comparing to Allen Institute uh, segmentation. Ah, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think the the novelty here. I mean, after we see all of this, uh, this the, the mapping from one uh, channel to another, I think the novelty here is uh, this uh, gradient. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, building this flow legend. I mean, this is really it's it's cool because you do some processing to build this representation, and then you use your network to actually map into this uh, new representation, which is a you know. <clears throat> So this is, I think, something that is uh, we have not seen in other application. And Leon, now I understand your idea from uh, this morning's uh, meeting that we had. Uh, the yeah. Because yeah. it's the same thing. I was very impressed, but now now I understand. I, I'm still impressed, right? <laughs> but I understand where it came from. Uh, it's similar, <laughs> yes. Yeah, Skip so the it's middle pretty middle. cool. So, so it's pretty cool. I think the idea of you do some processing, and here it's clever processing, right? It's not trivial building these maps, and then and then uh, then giving the network the task of learning this representation. <clears throat> and also, if I think about it from an intuition point, and tell me, uh, Leonie and Alon, if you agree, I'm not sure about that. But the idea would be, I mean, a lot of this, and maybe you said that in the, I'm not sure if today or in the previous presentation, but in a lot of the the classic uh, image processing uh, cell segmentation, nuclear segmentation tasks. The idea was to, was uh, like watershed algorithms, which was basically going and finding the basins within, so, so doing something similar in terms of optimization. Is it, is it relevant or? Uh, uh, yeah, they talked about in the paper that the uh, watershed uh, succeeded when the, the distribution was uh, evenly spreaded. So they created a distribution that would be evenly spreaded. Okay, yeah, I, I think it's a clever idea. I appreciate now, uh, I, I, I mean, most of the segmentation algorithms are in, and, and all these mappings are not very creative computationally at least. And here I think, uh, here I think the, it's very nice, so yeah. I think that we see here again the same ideas of uh, that we've seen with the nucleizer. Diverse data is good, right? <clears throat> uh, which is something that, uh, that uh, uh, is not, uh, not the completely obvious because you think sometimes that it's uh, better to specialize. A lot of data is good. Uh, and, and, and again, no parameters, which is critical, right? Segmentation with no parameters is very important. You don't want to start and tweak every every uh, small thing. And with that, uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's done. Uh, so we are moving now to uh, NN unit, Lior and which uh, you'll understand uh, quickly why, why it's relevant. Can I start? Okay, hi everyone. Uh, today we're gonna talk uh, on the paper that called NNUnet. 
uh, a self-configured method for deep learning based uh, biomedical image segmentation. My name is uh, Adi and together with me is uh, Leo. So as we talked before in general, the goal of segmentation is to simplify and change the representation of the image to, uh, to something that is more meaningful and easier to analyze. Semantic segmentation is to take a, a clustering part of the image together to the same class. Next. The unit architecture uh, have been used uh, for a wide uh, or various biomedical task and is con uh, consists of uh, two uh, parts, the encoder and the decoder. The encoder is used to capture the context of the image and the decoder is used to enable to precise the uh, localization uh, using tr transposed uh, convolutional uh, layers. After restarting with the unit architecture that is recommended for biomedical uh, segmentation, we are still a long way from a success model. We need to expend a lot of time uh, on pre-processing stage, a co a correct the configuration of the network and the hyperparameter. Uh, the configuration usually depends on our experience, our intuition, uh, and also uh, to validate the model, we need a, a knowledge from domain expert that tell us if the model is correct or not. Uh, and if not, we need to do all the iteration again and again. This, this uh, take or a lot of time from us. So nowadays there is a trendy buzzword, uh, the automated machine learning or AutoML uh, is enabled to non-expert to train high quality machine learning uh, models. Uh, the AutoML helps us help us the, to find the optimal solution uh, in efficiency way. As we can see, uh, the AutoML framework uh, do automatically uh, all the tasks that we need to do manually. It cleans the data, it creates feature and uh, make a feature selection. And after we finish the pre-processing, uh, it pick different uh, models and then a lot of models uh, on a given data set. Based on the model accuracy, it takes automatically the best model and then tries to increase the model accuracy by tuning the model uh, parameters. The NN unit uh, is a self-configuring method for uh, deep learning uh, based biomedical images. The NN unit is an auto ML framework that cr uh, creates automatically the full pipeline for segmentation task. Uh, the pipeline con uh, contain again, the pre-processing, the architecture, the training uh, process uh, and the post-process, but uh, it's focus uh, on the segmentation task uh, of biomedical images. Okay. So uh, in order to fully understand the process, we will go through uh, two examples, two data sets to understand how it works. And the first data set is ACDC, the Automated Cardiac Diagnosis Challenge. Uh, this data set contains 3D heart images. And the task is to segment between uh, right uh, ventricle, left ventricle, and left myocardium. And the second data set is called LITS, uh, the liver and the liver tumor segmentation. And here we have a 3D liver um, images and the task is to classify between liver and liver tumor, kaved ve gidol shu kaved. Okay, so the first step in the process is to uh, create the data set fingerprint. The data set fingerprint contains um, the uh, Data set uh, fingerprint con uh, contains features that are extracted from the data set or from the metadata of the data set. 
for example, we can see here that the, the median uh, image size, the number of classes, and the scanner type. Okay, so as, uh, as we've seen before, in every uh, AutoML uh, framework, we need to define uh, the search space. And here they define three types. The fixed parameter group contains uh, parameters that are identical between all of their tasks. The rule-based parameters uh, are depend on the data fingerprint and the machine we are using for uh, training and inference the network. And the empirical uh, parameter group contains um, parameters that are determined by uh, empirical tests. And in the, next, in the following slides, we'll see some example for each parameter group. Okay. We'll start with the fixed parameter group. And here we can see that uh, for both of the data sets, uh, these values are, uh, are identical, the learning grade, the optimizer, and the loss function, for example. Here we can see some example for the rule-based. And uh, we can see that the batch size for the ACDC, which contains a much larger images, uh, much smaller images, has a bigger uh, batch size um, compared to the LITS data set. And they have a special normalization for MRI images and special normalization for CT images. Oops, sorry. And in the empirical parameter group, we'll focus on the, uh, how they choose the architecture. So they train uh, four types of uh, unit-like uh, architecture, the 2D unit, uh, full resolution 3D unit, low resolution 3D unit, and uh, 3D unit uh, cascade. And they uh, choose the best model or a combination of two models uh, according to cross-validation. And here we can see that for each uh, data set, uh, the, the combination is uh, different. Okay. Okay, and here we can see the results. Uh, each uh, blue point is a different uh, baseline, and the red point is, there, is the NN unit uh, method. And we can see that for the ACDC, they achieve state of the art results, while for the LITs, uh, they achieve very good performance. Um, a very interesting uh, point in the paper that they evaluated their. Um, their method on a lot of uh, tasks, on 53 tasks, and they achieved uh, on most of the tasks, on 35 out of 53 of them, uh, state of the art. Okay. So uh, here we will uh, present our opinion about this paper. So the first point uh, that we think the, that uh, in the main contribution is that uh, they published a benchmark on dozens of tasks, uh, which is not an easy task uh, because we can see that in other papers, uh, they usually uh, evaluate their method only on one or two data sets. Uh, the second point is that uh, AutoML on biomedical images was not common, so, and this is one of the first papers that doing it. And we can think that this idea is very interesting and it can be generalized to other types of data sets. And the criticism uh, is that uh, we think that this paper is mainly an engineering paper and there isn't a research novelty because all of their methods, uh, sub-methods they used, for example, the unit and the pre-processing and all of, all of the methods they used are known and they didn't invent something uh, new. Uh, and these two points are, uh, are things that we think that they should do it like in the future work. And um, we think that the fixed parameters uh, should be uh, changed to rule-based because for example, uh, I showed you that uh, the loss, uh, the learning rate is a fixed value for all of the tasks. And as machine learning experts, we know that uh, there isn't any uh, golden value for the learning grade. Uh, so they should uh, use some rule-based. 
And the second point is that uh, we think that the handcrafted roof should be uh, changed to a learning model that uh, uh, is trained on some of the data sets uh, to achieve the best uh, 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 roof uh, and not handcrafted. Mm. I have uh, one question. Uh, mm -hmm. How much time does it take to train this network in, uh, if you compare it to just a simple uh, unit? Um, it's an interesting question because we thought about it too and we couldn't find uh, not in the main uh, paper and not in the appendix. Um, uh, the tie, the training time and the evaluation time, uh, because even ensemble uh, can take uh, much more time to uh, to for the inference. Um, yeah, but they don't talk about it. So, so I want to say about it two things. One that in less usually we don't do real time analysis. So in, in this type of uh, in this type of application. So in principle, we don't care about the time. But of course, uh, this I, I agree with uh, Leon. The, it seems that it's going to, yeah, that it, it probably takes a lot of time to optimize everything. And I think this is probably, Leo, the answer to your suggestion on making the fix, optimizing fixed parameters and optimizing role base. Probably the reason for not doing that is just time, right? I mean, it's just you, you had another. I, an additional set of parameters, you're trying to optimize everything. It's not going, you know, it's uh, it's just, you need to focus on what is probably most important for you because otherwise it's not going to, it's not going to take too long. That's, does it make sense? Um, I think that the, that once they uh, train the, uh, a model to choose the hyper, the rule-based, um, they should do it one time and they can evaluate it on other uh, data sets. So, but this. how? I mean, in principle, you need to optimize for each data set. You take your training data and then you optimize mm -hmm. all the parameters. And basically, you need to optimize that as well, along with the other parameters, based on what you suggested. And this will just take, you know, it's, it's just, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, now they have a general rule for the handcrafted rule. They, it's general to, to all of their data sets. So I think that if they try to, um, to, um, to make one model that is trained on, I don't know, 70% of their tasks and try to uh, optimize the accuracy, uh, they could achieve better, uh, better rules instead of handcrafted. Uh, okay. Again, they need to do it only one time. Uh, they didn't say anything about the uh, about the uh, time optimization, you know, because the, the trade off between uh, time and uh, performance and, and the number of parameters that they need to uh, optimize. I, I think in the, in the discussion, did you what, what did they say in the discussion of this paper? I actually read it, I but forgot. I think that this this mission is or this task is uh, the optimization is. Uh, uh, oh, the performance is just across 53 tasks. It's a lot, it's more than two, but it's not all. I think that there is will be a task that the uh, automatic way is uh, give, give us a suboptimal uh, or not the optimal uh, performance. So we think that we need to learn the hyperparameter in some way. We can reduce uh, the 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 search space or limit the search space the search search space, but we also uh, think that we need to learn it, not just uh, take an assumption that in the all cases we need uh, the same learning grade, the same uh, uh, parameter or same rules. Yeah. Okay. So so either you, I mean, if if you have even two learning grades, right? You have twice the number of configurations in principle, you know, naively. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take you twice the time to, to train your network. You know, it's not exactly, but, but okay. I don't know. I, I think it's actually, I, I'm surprised that we didn't discuss it, but it's, if I would have to, if I would have to, you know, to 
to Lenachesh to for uh, Lenachesh yes. 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 yes yes I would say that they it's, it's kind of a balancing I mean they try to balance I I would get that but I don't know I think I explained myself uh, myself not uh, very clear because I didn't say I didn't mean that I want to optimize uh, the all of the hyperparameters the learning rate and the uh, optimizer and all, and all of these parameters. I think that we can learn, we can create an, a model that uh, uh, gets all the data set uh, fingerprint. And the, this model um, uh, it, um, will compute the learning rate, which optimizer will be the best. Uh, I don't know which uh, loss function it should use, but the model is trained one time. And when I want to use the NN unit for other tasks, then I can uh, use this model, which is already trained on, I don't know, half of the data sets. So basically using the, the knowledge that you already gained from these 50 mm -hmm. something data sets to, okay, yeah, that, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes more sense. Yes. Okay, Sarabha. So, yeah, so I think in general, uh, we saw three segmentation papers, and they came very close to one another. And usually segmentation papers are not published and uh, do not make such a, such a big noise. I think it's first, it's a nice uh, demonstration of how these competitions are engaging computer scientists or computational scientists into, into, into solving problems. And then you get the fruits later on. And I think the idea that we saw here of uh, trying to minimize the parameters uh, using diverse data sets and a lot of data. And uh, yeah, basically that's it. These are the, the main messages that now I think everybody will go uh, along with. And, and, and basically, I think segmentation for practical uh, measurements is almost a solved problem today. So, I mean, yeah, you need maybe to optimize a little bit, but it's not very, very, very different than, uh, I don't know, than five, 10 years ago. I think the tools today are just, they're fantastic. Uh, okay, so let's go to a break and we'll be back at the 12 bus four. Okay, so I think that we stopped here last time. And uh, we've, seen, we've seen examples of, uh, of uh, three modes of uh, quantitative image analysis in screening data. One was measuring known phenotypes. So I remind you the example of the, of the uh, what was that? Tubo Hatsevet Bakitsu? Yeah, I think that they showed that they uh, killed the, the bacteria and kept the cells alive, right? Looking for treatments that, that did that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and did we see examples of training for phenotype? I think that we did. I'm not sure, we'll see. Okay, so uh, this is uh, not new. But uh, talking about high throughput screens or high content screens, throughput is the speed that you can generate a lot of images fast and content is the magnitude of the data. So how much data you have. So you don't have to be really speedy. If you collect a lot of data, it's considered high content. Uh, but what they say here, and it's, uh, I think it's changing now, but this is from 2008 of uh, N14, that high content screens are not very high in information content and in these years, most of, the, most of the screening papers actually collected a lot of data, but measured only a few cellular features. Now, it's fine if this is, I mean, if you, I have to say that because I just reviewed the papers that did exactly the opposite. And they had a very clear, they should have very, a very clear, so they discussed a very specific biological question with known kind of known phenotypes, known, cell shapes, et cetera, uh, but, they did, uh, but they did extract a lot of features to, to represent what's going on. And then they did the whole circle to go back and eventually they finished with the simple features that I would start with because this problem is, for this problem, it was the right way to go. So there is no, if, if you know what you're looking for, there is no reason to go for, for, um, 
for, for many features. You just measure what you really need to, to know and that's it. And see what, uh, what drugs uh, solve this problem on what you, want to, what you want to achieve. But if you do not want to do that, or if you do not, do not know, if you do not know, I'm sorry, you, don't, you do not know exactly what is the, 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 the phenotype. The phenotype is a complex combination of different, of different uh, 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 subtle differences within the cells. Then you can let the data tell you where, where the signal is and let the data uh, do a data-driven a data, a data analysis. So in principle, uh, the data, data science approach, measure everything and ask questions later. So what you see here, we have cells, we have morphological features, which are extracted uh, automatically. And now, uh, and this, this idea is, uh, goes back uh, almost uh, 20 years to 2004. But now you can, you have a profile, which in, 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 in a standard, you know, in, in, in standard analysis, it's usually the average, a, a average um, a feature vector of, uh, of cells within a, a given treatment or a given treatment in a given uh, experimental well. And now you can start uh, doing playing with this type of data. Okay, so this is a cell. So you can measure many, many features, size, shape, uh, intensities of the fluorescent, the texture, et cetera. And the idea is uh, that uh, phenotypes are not always uh, simple and trivial, like cell size or the eccentricity, the elongation of the cell. Sometimes you need something more complex than that. Uh, yeah, so in principle, you can do one screen and then you can find interesting hits, things that, that, that uh, uh, treatments that transform your, your, your cells to look uh, uh, healthier or better, et cetera. And then you can, and then you can, uh, and then you can uh, uh, analyze it and see and explain what are the phenotypes. And, and yeah, it's good when you don't know exactly what you're looking for in advance. Uh, sometimes you also want, uh, we also want to get the, the and we're not looking at the specific hit, but we want to map the whole landscape of different how the, uh, different treatments are are are, are uh, shifting our uh, represent our the appearance of our cells, and for that uh, we might want to to do to analyze everything and then to do some kind of whatever clustering, linking the the, the molecular uh, uh, composition of a, of, a, of a drug to, to to a phenotype and stuff like that. So the second idea uh, is iterative machine learning. And the idea here is that uh, a, an expert can say uh, whether it's a class A or class B or class C, but they cannot exactly explain why they make this decision or they can make very general rules. So if this is the case, in principle, what you can do, you can have a human in the loop and let the human do annotations without extracting any specific uh, features to do that. And then basically what you do, you let the machine uh, uh, train on the ground truth annotation and make the decision. So this is what you do. You take the cells, you score them, and then you train uh, machine learning models to, to, uh, to, uh, to predict scores that the human, human, the human does. In this case, it's again, I mean, here, the, the advantage of, uh, of the, the technique is, is, is replacing, you still need the human in the loop. I mean, and you'll get the, the, the best that you can get, you can achieve with the performance of a human being, of an expert. <clears throat> so here are examples. Uh, you, can, you can look at these images and you can extract, you can see that the, for example, the worms here and the worms here are different. So you have here, here an effect, so you can annotate if they are affected or not affected. Uh, but if you are, but, but, but in this case, uh, you might want, so if you know in advance what you want to exactly measure, it's fine and you can measure that specifically. But if you are not sure, or not sure what would be the discriminative measures then just use the annotation and train a model to, to discriminate. 
Sometimes it's really hard to do the communication. So there is the computer scientist and there is the cell biologist. And the cell biologist says, I know that this is, you know, this is treated, that this is not based on the phenotype. But then explaining to the engineer how to build, uh, how, how to extract the features, for example, it, 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 it's hard. So, I mean, now I think with the deep learning, it's becoming more and more uh, also the, uh, I mean, the features are, uh, the idea of not extracting features in advance and letting the machine learning the feature is, is becoming more acceptable across also these domains. But this is the idea in principle. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm not sure about that because I, I checked that and it seems that the, 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 there is this, uh, there were previously cell profiler analysts that uh, this, this, did this type of, uh, gave a platform to do this type of thing. And they were promoting a new platform called the uh, Piximi. But uh, I checked it and it seems that it's not very active. So I think, I don't know, probably, probably it's, not, uh, it's not relevant. So here is an example. Uh, you let the human annotate. So here are different annotation of, uh, of, uh, of the cells in context of cell division. And now you let the machine uh, train, extract all the morphological features and use whatever it needs to, to, to uh, predict accurately the phenotype. Okay, so here we have uh, the two easy uh, um, applications. Both the human can do this. Can basically, if you have an expert and, and enough time and money to pay them, they can do it by themselves. The machine is only to automate this process. Or to, yeah, yeah, basically it's only to automate the process. And the third and most exciting is the cell profiling, which is aimed at discovering new phenotypes. So there are several applications of cell profiling. So for example, and all of them are based on the assumption, which is a big assumption. It makes sense, but it is a big assumption. We, we need to, to be aware that this is an assumption that is taken, that the, the appearance of a cell is correlated to the functional outcome, right? It's not necessarily, you could think that, uh, that the uh, cells that are treated with, that, that are in their very, that are, uh, you know, you can, you can have a healthy cells and uh, sick cells, and you can turn your sick cells to, to, to look more similar to the healthy cells. It might not mean that the cells are healthy. It might mean that you just did something artificial. Well, that's, that's true, but uh, the assumption of, uh, of uh, similarity between the, the appearance, the morphology, the molecular composition of a cell to the function is, is, is something that is uh, quite common. And in screening, this is just the first step in a long pipeline that starts in screening all of these molecules, for example, and eventually getting to the, to the position of, of, uh, of having one drug from many thousands, millions of uh, molecules like that. So it's just the first step. So if we find something interesting here, it will need to be validated later, which it might fail, but it might uh, work. And there is a strong correlation between how a cell, uh, the appearance of a cell or, and the cell function, which gives some support for this uh, uh, intuition. So we still need to be aware of that. Okay, so some applications of profiling. Uh, if we have healthy cell and sick cells, we can identify signatures of uh, diseases. Uh, for example, uh, this is a, um, uh, in the melanoma project, we tried to do something like that, right? Although it was not a, a screen per se, but uh, we tried to predict uh, the high metastatic and, uh, and high and low metastatic efficiency. Uh, identify small molecules with mimics of genetic uh, perturbation. So genetic perturbation is going into the cell and changing something in a controlled manner, right? Doing, for example, genome engineering, using CRISPR and genome engineering to uh, inhibit, the cell, inhibit some, uh, some protein within a cell. This requires, um, it's, it's, it's labor intensive doing that. So you need a person going in and doing the molecular biology. It is expensive, it, is, uh, it, it takes a lot of labor. Uh, and, 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 and if you'd be able to just put something within your, within your uh, media of the cells, within the food of the cells, and, 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 and 
and make them eat it and, 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 and inhibit the same molecule and be very specific, that would be great because it could, could be used as a tool. Everybody can use it instead of doing the fine molecular biology. And we can see that, for example, uh, I'm working with uh, someone in uh, um, mechanical, mechanical engineering in, in uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, she's, you know, she, she, she is doing a cell biology experiment, but she's not going to do a lot of molecular biology in her lab. And instead, and she's very interested in contractility, kivut, which is uh, relevant for, for how cells generate force. And if she would have needed to go and uh, pinpoint the, the proteins within the cell that are responsible for the contractility, it will be, it will be hard work. Instead of that, there is a very, there are several known uh, uh, small molecule inhibitors, which are basically some chemicals that you put into your media and your cells, and then, and then it inhibits, inhibits the morita period of, uh, of uh, the contractility machinery. So it makes life of thousands, ten thousands of scientists much easier instead of needing to be able to do the molecular biology. So the idea here is that if we, know a target by doing a, 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 a targeted perturbation. And then we now can look for all a, a, a library of a small molecule and just see if they can do the same phenotype, then, then maybe we can get a cheaper solution. Uh, characterize again, gene phenotype, but it's the same thing. I mean, basically it's, it's mapping the, uh, it's something that you know to, 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 a, to a molecule determine chemical mecha mechanism of action. If you have, now it's the other way around, mechanism of action that if you, if you now have a chemical that you put in your cells and it does something and you want to know what does it does within the cell, what did it change with the cell? You don't know, you just put the chemical and something happens. Then you can do the same thing. You can look for similarities in terms of the morphology and from that make some uh, hypothesis regarding what this uh, drug is doing. Um, yeah, okay. One, one, one example is, uh, is also rare diseases where you don't have, you know, you don't, you cannot put a lot of, uh, uh, you, you need a, a, a cheap and easy assay that will, uh, drug companies, some of them do put money in that, but some of them, some of the diseases are really, really rare and, uh, and it's not worth uh, putting a lot of uh, research and development effort, efforts. But in this case of, of uh, cell profiling, it actually can provide a solution because in principle you can, and, and I know a few examples of that, of very rare diseases where, uh, where uh, people took the cells from the, the patient, right? And then they screened for drugs that will try to, to make the cells look more similar to healthy cells. And this is so, so in principle, you can do like personalized uh, a, a drug targeting within that. So uh, yeah, so what you see here is the recursion pharma. So, so in principle, there was, if you look historically, there was a big hype about the cell profiling and people thought it's going to change the world. And then uh, they realized that there are a lot of problems with that and the industry become uh, less, uh, you know, Less excited, and now the hype is uh, up again. Uh, so all there is a lot of effort. The drug companies, startup, etc. I think I showed you some slides with a lot of uh, companies that put uh, put some uh, effort in that. So now we are we're on the trend up, and I hope that it will stay. Uh, time will tell in terms of how many drugs will come with uh, starting with these techniques, and how these techniques can not necessarily do the whole thing, but how they can uh, be part of the process of drug development and, and, and have this, uh, you have this uh, uh, of uh, starting with so many options and then, uh, then filtering until you get one drug, then maybe it will have somewhere in the beginning of the process in the drug discovery process. And one of the companies that actually made it, uh, made, made uh, a lot of people optimistic is this recursion medical. Uh, so, I mean, this is an example, you have a healthy phenotype and a disease phenotype. And now you are looking for a drug that you will take your disease phenotype and will transform it to a healthy phenotype under the assumption that if you do that, then, then um, uh, uh, you are going to solve the problem. 
Uh, yeah, so here is an example of a, of a disease where, uh, where drugs that were selected based on the automated processing uh, was uh, better than uh, something by visual analysis. And now they are, uh, now this is very, uh, this is advanced. I mean, the, you have a lot, of, a lot of things here that you need to take into consideration. For example, what is the cell model that you're going to use for your screening? So you can either use uh, cells taken directly from patients, or you can use, which are hard to assess, and uh, they are very different between even the same patients in different times, or you can use cell lines. So there is always this trade-off between uh, what you can do here. But now uh, there are more cell models, and the technology is uh, also more effective, and the computational tools are also better. So hopefully this will, uh, uh, will lead to good, uh, to good outcomes. Already there are several uh, drugs that are in uh, advanced clinical stages uh, that, uh, that have these uh, processes of cell profiling involved within, within them. So signatures of gene compounds and uh, diseases. Uh, one essay that is, uh, that is uh, very common now in this, uh, in this domain is the uh, cell painting. I'm, I'm going, I think I'm going to, I have another slide on that. Uh, in principle, the idea would be to, uh, to image in parallel multiple, um, multiple uh, uh, markers within your cell. So in principle, you take your cell model, you fix it, and then you label it. Like I said, for the label to label, you remember that you had multiple labels for the same organelle within the cell. So now you, you have here six different uh, dyes that capture like eight different organelles, some of them are mixed. And now you have all this information about the organization within the cell. It gives you really a lot of information well beyond the shape. And the idea now you have these different perturbations, uh, you have profiles for each of these perturbations, and then you can do different things such as clustering, right? Questions? So I think I, I, I talked about it a few slides ago. This is just more specific. Uh, you have a, 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 you want to identify small molecules that inhibit, that uh, not inhibit, that mimic genetic perturbation. You take something that you know, uh, you, you take a genetic uh, perturbation that you are, you know what, what happened there. And then what you do, you take all your screening data, all your cell profiles, and you're looking for ones that are similar in their profile to what you were looking for. And then in principle, you say, oh, this could be a good candidate for a, 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 a small molecule inhibitor of this specific uh, target. And the mechanism of action is the other way around. You start with the compound and you try to understand what, what's going on, what does it do? So you go to screenings that they involve a, a control the experiment where each time you inhibit the one specific molecule or overexpress one specific molecule, and then you do the other way around. You start with the small molecule, you go back and you, you identify the potential mechanisms, and then you link a mechanism to a molecule that you don't know what it, what it does. So it's all, it's, all, it's all very similar in terms of uh, uh, computationally what you do. But each of these solves a different problem and can, can give a solution for a whole set of, uh, of biological application, biological or medical application. Uh, yeah, lead doping is also jumping from, from something that you know is a solution and looking for, for other, for other uh, solution. For example, you have a, a, a molecule that does something, uh, you have a, a drug that, uh, that does a good job but it has side effects or it's expensive or whatever. And now you can uh, go through libraries of uh, other drugs and look whether you can find something that does a similar effect. Maybe it will be with less side effects, maybe it will be cheaper and this can also improve. So, uh, so yeah, another idea, yeah. Uh, Okay, so the, this paper showed that cell painting is actually, cell painting with the six different channels actually uh, uh, contains a lot of useful information. Uh, they compared it to, uh, to another screen of gene expression and showed that, that this was very informative.
Okay, so now that we are convinced that the self profiling is uh, could 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 uh, be useful, let's go over the self profiling or high throughput phenotyping pipeline. And the pipeline, uh, this is the classic pipeline. You see, this is a, a a review paper from 2017. And the only change now is that sometimes you know the, the the this review is actually a very good review if you want to read about the subject. And uh, the only thing that is it is missing is the 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 revolution in the deep learning and and now there is another newer uh, review that includes that as well. I like this one better, but the review from 2020 it, it goes a little more into the medical aspect and it talks about uh, deep learning and potential variant, etc. Uh, yeah, so this is the pipeline. I want to go through it quickly. And one of the one of the key issues here to deal with the screening is is te technical issues. So one major technical issues is quality control. What you see here is a is a plate from a screen. So each uh, square here is an uh, is 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 a, a is an outcome of a, of a, of a specific well buried in the experiment. So basically, each 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 well here is an experiment, and you get something. Ideally, you are not expecting to see any patterns. I mean, you are going you are expecting to see heat. So light uh, green or 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 uh, or uh, red are heats in the screen. Something interesting that is going on. It, but here you can you can see patterns. For example, you can see these red patterns that come in every second uh, column, right? Or this green again here, the, the pattern within the, the the columns is very clear. So if we are going, if there is a really a huge bias within our uh, images, like I think it's it's relevant to what uh, Gil and uh, Eagle showed with their uh, probabilistic uh, noise to uh, 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 noise to void, where uh, they said it's not you know it's not clear that you are going to get the same phenotype in in everything. It, there, is, there might be bias within your image. So here there is bias within the spatial location. And we need to make sure that we don't have this type of biases or to, to deal with them, because otherwise we would be biased in selecting our hits uh, in the screen. So you can see here, uh, all kinds of artifacts. Here you can see the lines here. Here you can see the green in the middle. Here you can see this green in the, in the uh, right-hand side. And basically one of the, the key ideas to solve that is to use controls, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. So one problem uh, also that causes that is exactly non-homogeneous uh, illumination across the image field. So you can see these are uh, images of different, of three different channels across the plate. So here, this is very, uh, you can see it uh, in very low resolution, but each image here is, is huge. Each image is like what you have here, where each, uh, been is, is full of cells, right? So if this is your, if this is how your data looks like, you're probably going to be biased by how you, uh, how you, in, in the results that you get, and this might be cause problems in finding hits. And again, I, I want to 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 emphasize that if you want to find hits, you want to find a corona drug, right? And there is a paper on that if someone wants to pick it. So you're going to do a lot of, you're going to try a lot of things. You're going to get only a few hits. So if you are heavily biased by things like that, illumination or something else within the spatial structure, you might miss the, the few hits that, that, that are hidden within the screen. So the screen is not that like everything is, is very informative or necessarily. Sometimes you're really looking for the anomalies, something that is very, uh, um, uh, rare within your uh, sample. So this is this is one thing you need to to make sure that you deal with non-homogeneous uh, illumination. And this is an example on, on on dealing with that. So this is the incorrected image, and this is the corrected image. Uh, I mean, you can see differences here. This is the zoom in. The red here is you can see here in the middle uh, uh, row. You can see the zoom in. It doesn't seem very different, right? You see some differences, but when you go to eventually, what you do here, uh, if you go to if if you go to uh, 
extract the single cell properties and, and, and use them to define the, the profile of the, the treatment, you need to go through a segmentation stage. And in this case, they showed that the same algorithm will work better when you correct the illumination. So here, for example, with the arrow here, you can see two cells that are nicely separated, while here on the left, they are not. So they showed that uh, if you correct your illumination, you can get uh, you can get uh, 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 more accurate results in terms of of, 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 uh, of your post processing of your data. Uh, so can I ask a question? Yeah. So for uh, image based phenotyping for drug discovery, uh, on the hits which you said, how will you uh, get three dimensional coordinates for the hits if from an image? Hits are the, the, the treatments. Yeah. In principle, in principle, you have this. You have a, 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 a robotic machinery that puts in each of these, it puts the drug. You know which drug it, it put where. You, you find the wells that have the phenotypes that you are interested in, that shift the cells into the healthy state. And you know where what well it is, and then you know what uh, drug you put there. And then you start uh, validating this drug and start into this uh, long, long. Uh, uh, I, I meant for image based. So uh, most of the time, it doesn't work. If you tried for drug discovery, I, I need a more specific question. Uh, the previous slide for uh, image based drug uh, before this. No. Yeah, 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 the, the, yeah, this one. Uh, from this, you can't extract uh, coordinates of each, like you can't extract positions of each one, right? In a three dimensional space. So it doesn't work very well. I, I, sorry, I cannot understand your question. Can you try to articulate it uh, better? Okay. Uh, so if you try image-based screening for a drug discovery process, there's a chance that it will fail a lot of times rather than you do it in a wet lab. It is, I mean, you do, you do it in a wet lab. You image your, of course you do it in a wet lab. You image your cells. And then you do the computation. I, I don't understand the question. I try try to think if you can clarify the question. Okay. okay I, then, I, I'll, yeah, I'll do it and then ask it again. Okay. okay, so these are all challenges, right? Challenges. Why it's so hard? I mean, why it's uh, why it's so much uh, so much work? Here is a, another example. Uh, whether you are really measuring something or you have something or you have a confounding uh, factor. Uh, so it could be that, uh, that uh, what you see is uh, just an artifact of something else that is going on that is correlated, right? One example is, uh, is the cell density. So cell density is uh, correlated to many, many things. Yeah, the, the cells, when they are more packed together, uh, they, they change how they look and their behavior and everything. You can just think about size, right? I mean, if you are in a crowd, the cells are like becoming smaller. So of course you're going to have a phenotype. If the cell is smaller, the molecular composition is also going to change. And, and of course the features are going to be different. So you want to make sure that what you find is not an artifact of something that is the confounding factor, it's something completely different, right? And uh, if you are interested in, in a specific phenotype, but you are, you are tricked to think that you, you found something and it's something else, it, it could be a big uh, problem. And, uh, and now, okay, and here is another example. So once we do the screen and we find hits, for example, uh, uh, here, this hit, right? So this hit and hit is now dark uh, red, okay? You can see it here, the, the score. How, how, how significant is the heat? The, 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 yeah. So, and each, each, each here, each one here is a well, and uh, you see this well, and it looks uh, okay. But you see this well, which is also a heat, and you can see that it's, there is something completely wrong within the image. So, it was 
the image was completely fucked up, and then uh, because of that, you found something that is a hit. So there was, I'm just showing all the challenges and all the quality controls that you need to, to do before you can uh, say, okay, I found something that is uh, promising. So usually what people do in order to deal to, with many of these issues, first, yeah, they do calibration and, 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 and these screens are done in, lot of, in kind of a factory more like settings where people can control everything in a more uh, precise way. They're not just in a, 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 a and, and then also within your uh, plate, uh, you put controls. And what are controls? Controls are, for example, if you have a, a healthy cell and diseased cells, so these are going to be the controls. So we're going to have healthy cells, diseased cells, and here we're going to have everything, all the treatment. It, it is wasting us, in, in, on one hand, it is wasting us, right? We're, we're wasting space, we're wasting wells. And so we can use less treatments in this plate. But on the other hand, we get good controls. So we can get now, uh, first see something went wrong because we're expecting this, this to be blue and this to be red. And also um, and to collect enough statistics on the specific experiment in the same day. So if the cells are not exactly, I, I showed you in my melanoma project that we had some bias because of day of imaging. So if you have controls from the same day, you can, it can help you understand where you are at compared to the same day of imaging. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question about it? Yeah. Um, we usually expect the artifact to be on the entire batch or in uh, some of the wells. So I showed you several examples. Illuminate and even illumination, you are going to have an effect on some of the some regions, right? Um, uh, there are there are. Uh, effects that are uh, general for the whole place, for the whole experiment, and there are some that are specific to specific location. I, I agree that if you want to be more uh, systematic, I mean, this is just, you know, just for the presentation. Usually you don't do it this way. You put your, if, the, if this is what you were you Spread it. Then you're right. Yeah, you're putting them to randomly, right, to, 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 to capture the whole space so to find out if something is wrong, you'll be able to identify it. Okay? So here is a nice uh, visualization of that. So you see here the different plates and you hear a similarity in the profiles between the plates. Each, uh, again, each pin here is a well. And you can see that there is a clear pattern in this data, right? That uh, a plate uh, one and plate two are, uh, are, are, uh, are very similar to one another and they are not similar to plate uh, three and four, okay? Oh, it should be, I think this is a mistake. It should be the plate one and then. basically this is, this should be plate one, this will be plate two. Anyway, this, this is an, an extreme example of batch effects. Batch effects, batch are okay, uh, uh, something that happens in the same day of imaging or in the, in the setting of the experiment. If you do something a little bit different than you did in the previous days, it could have an effect. So it's a, uh, uh, yeah, non-biological specific factor that causes, yeah, something like that. Another uh, hurdle is off-target effects. This is this is complex. This is complex stuff. This is real-world difficulties in this type of data. It's not it's not a joke. So this is another challenge. Uh, off-target effects. What is off-target effects? If you target something within your cells, you target a specific molecule, there might be that you are also causing side effects within your cell. So you're targeting what you want to target and you can validate that, but you might also target other things around within your cell that you are not aware of. And then if you get something out, if you say, see a change in the cells, it could be caused because you targeted what you, what you intended to, or it could be something completely unrelated. And this is, this is a problem, right? So uh, uh, one of the, and this is a real problem. And uh, here, here is an example. Here is an example where uh, a correlation between um, uh, replicates of the same uh, uh, shRNA sequence. And uh, one second. 
yeah, this always confuses me, this slide. I don't know why. I mean, always. It's the second time I'm presenting it. Let's see. Correlation between different uh, SHRNA sequences, which is zero. And correlation between replicates of the same SHRNA sequence. One second, I was. Ah, yeah, this is. This means it's okay. This is good. Yeah, sorry. I think the next slide is what I was what, what I was intending to. Okay, so this this makes sense, right? So if you have this shRNA is, is targeting something within targeting a a, a a gene within your within your cell. So when you target the same sequence, you get correlative responses, right? Which is good. And when you take a different uh, when you take different targeting with different shRNAs, you do not get correlation, which is good. So, so far we are okay. And here, this is the problem now, where you take, uh, when, we, when we take, uh, when we look at the seed, so the shRNA, you have a, a, a seed and you have, the, the, you have something that you have something that is, you shouldn't have an effect, which is the seed, but it could be different seeds. And you have the, the 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 specific genes that you are targeting. So these are two things. The seed should not have an effect. And if it has an effect, it means that it, these are off target effects. So you can now you can look at the combinations here. So if you have the same seed, and uh, if you have I'm sorry, the diff different gene and different uh, seed pairs, you don't get any signal, which makes sense. If you take the same gene. And different seed pairs, uh, and different seed pairs. What's going on here? I know that this is always confusing me. I, I sh same gene you're targeting, and different seed pairs. So a lot of time. Yeah, you are not going here. You are expecting to see a correlation, but you do not see a correlation. And in the red, you have the same seed and different gene pairs. And because you use the same seed, you have a high correlation, which is not completely opposite from what you would expect. You would expect the seed not to have an effect. And in this experiment, they showed that the, the seed could have a major effect. And actually, the gene, the seed is more important than what you are targeting. So, this is a big problem here. And now there are better techniques to do that. But in principle, even if you do in this type of uh, screen with shRNA, the idea would be, this is just one paper. It's not a, a technique that is completely useless. And I'm going to uh, next week to show you an example of uh, a, a project that I, that I did with shRNA, with the same uh, technique uh, to, to silence the gene. Uh, but if you want to be sure that you really captured something real, what you will have to do is use different seeds, right? And validate that you have the same phenotype, okay? Use different seeds for targeting the same protein and show that you still have the same phenotype and then you are convinced. Anyway, this is another hurdle here in the way. It's really, really, it's not easy. Okay. So if you look at the image analysis pipeline, and uh, we want to go from image to single cell features. We need to correct elimination, to do segmentation. If we have a, a live imaging screens, which they're not much, most of them are fixed cells. But if we do, we want probably to do a cell tracking. And based on, on, on that, we can start extracting all kinds of features that relate to, uh, to the the, the morphology and the, and the texture and distribution and the context uh, with the neighbors, etc. cetera. And, uh, and then we want to do all the quality controls that we said before, so we can uh, build the uh, solutions to identify debris, uh, saturation, focus issues. Uh, we want to identify if something, if the cells are completely crazy for this segment. So there is a lot of steps here in the way which are very technical in order to clean the data, very, uh, the data, you know, dealing with messy data in the way, dealing with missing value, uh, whether there is some effect in the, in, the, in the layout of the plate, like I showed you before, 
uh, batch effects, so normalizing for the days of the experiment, and, 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 and normalizing the features so that it can be comparable to one another. Uh, and then the standard approaches are you do dimensionality reduction for visualization or for clustering, and, uh, and then what you want to do is compare population. Uh, sometimes you'd like to, so the standard approach would be to uh, take the average uh, features of all the cells in your population, right? Which is basically, it means that you are ignoring the heterogeneity, but this is quite effective when you have a strong phenotype, you can still, it still is valuable. And there are a few papers, and one of them I'm going to show you probably next time, that try to, to encode this heterogeneity within screening. It's not simple at all. It's, it's not, a, it's a, a simple in terms of, a, of showing that it, it has benefit, that it is improving the ability to predict something here. Uh, yeah, and you can construct your profile, which is the high dimensional representation based on images, a complete field of views, wealth, replica, on all the scaling. And now you can start uh, measuring the profile similarity and do your, your downstream analysis, which is basically the clustering or, re, or re classification or similarity analysis and stuff like that. So this is the pipeline of, uh, this is the pipeline of, um, of uh, cell profiling or high, high throughput, uh, high content uh, phenotyping. Okay, so you found the heat, for example, uh, uh, and then uh, the next question is interpretability. So you find something. What 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 did you find? What 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 did the what did you capture exactly? So uh, one uh, one uh, you know the sta one standard solution is doing clustering on the effects of the different uh, treatments, and then cluster them, and then look somewhere in the middle of the cluster and take an image and just stare at these images. And assuming that the images are the effect is uh, so there is a strong enough an effect you're going to see because the clusters are basically it's based on that, on the appearance of the cells, you should be able to see uh, uh, appearances, differences between the cells. For example, here you can see a uh, cell size, something trivial as cell size. Another thing that you can do, and there was a pretty nice paper, I think that came out last year, is uh, trying to, to, uh, to correlate the chemical structure to the phenotype. There is more, I think there is a lot to do here yet. Uh, you can look at what are the features that distinguish between the different clusters and then uh, look at them and understand, you know, just understand what they mean. And or you can put more effort in visualization and I think that I'll end with, uh, with that. So this is an example of a, of a very simple idea uh, which is, I mean, it's fine. I didn't see a lot of people use it, but it's, uh, but I think it's, you know, it's nice. I mean, the problem of a, uh, of a uh, visualization, because uh, it's hard for us to look at these images and to come with a clear, uh, a clear morphological uh, description of what, what happened. So what they did, they made like a, 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 a glyph based, a representation of a cell. And then they represented visually each feature within the cell. So these are features that were captured within the screen. And now, uh, now once you have a bunch of numbers, you can create the representative uh, image. And, uh, and now you can start uh, looking at the, how your cells look. And based on that, uh, uh, understand, try to interpret what are the cellular properties that. Uh, that the uh, treatment cause or didn't cause. Okay, so I think it's a good time to stop here. And next week we'll finish uh, this. I'll present to you a, a project, a screening project. I'm going to present, we finished the screening. I'm going to show you all kinds of examples, like very, uh, I go very quickly on, on, on several papers that I find uh, interesting on screening. And uh, then I'm going to speak more about my project. Uh, on my screening project that, uh, that, uh, 
that I did. And I'm going to talk about the project, project for this course. So any questions, any thoughts before we go home? Tchau, Tio, next week.